So this is the SRIO VBuff. Um, seems like we had a lot of SRIOV uh, topics while we were here, so I thought it would be worthwhile to have a buff. Um, I have a quick overview of existing support. Uh, at least what I put in there, there's probably more things that, that are actually supported. I know Alex did, a, did kind of an overview today and kind of showed some stuff that you could do with VF, so that was good. Um, we just had this, uh, the flow-based thing that integrated with OBS. I, um, I sort of left that off the list here, but we could talk about it. Um, you know, I, I kind of would like to get the fundamental representation correct and then build OVS on top, but um, I think we'll have more than enough time if we want to talk about OVS as well. Um, I'll just jump in. Feel free to jump up and talk, too, because it's just me up here. So it'll be quick and boring if, if nobody says anything, which uh, if that's what you want because it's Friday afternoon, then, then don't say anything. All right. So, so it's been a long time since we've had SRLV support, and we've sort of been in the same state for multiple years now, um, at least since we've had 10 gig cards. And I haven't really seen a whole lot of um, sort of new and uh, innovation on this side of, of Linux lately. Um, you know, we're, we're, I think this discussion has been coming up and, and starting to go forward, but uh, we haven't really made a ton of progress. So, you know, we added this FTB add um, as part of the bridge tool. I think we called it BR for a while. But, um, you know, so we had bridge, FTB add, and then, um, and then kind of as part of that, the, the Linux bridge got a lot of support for VLANs. It got a lot of support for um, doing, uh, you know, uh, basically supporting multiple VLANs, supporting multicast, and all this good stuff. And I, I don't know if any of the drivers actually have added any of that support. I haven't seen it. Certainly the Intel drivers don't support it, and I haven't seen any patches too. So, so maybe that would just be a nice thing to see, you know, uh, L2, v, actual truly L2 support for, for VFs. Um, the other thing that we did at the same time is we, total, we integrated with libvirt, which means, which means that you have um, integration with anything above, uh, like a controller running above Linux easily, kind of native support for it if it uses libvirt. Um, I, I, I kind of like this model. It's something OpenStack knows how to use. It, it's something that other controllers know how to use and other um, orchestration layers. I'd like to see that kind of going forward. You know, if, if people add new features, it would be nice if they also added this kind of support into libvirt and, and we could kind of keep that going. Um, I, I know it's poorly documented. It's, it's on my list. I mean, if somebody wanted to pick that up, that would be awesome. Because uh, right now there's, there's kind of cryptic XML you can type in and, and I've actually gotten pretty good at it myself. But uh, I don't know if it's well known how to build these XML files that QEMU uses to generate, you know, SROV. Alex is shaking his head. I've, have you done the, the cool XML the tricks? Yeah, uh, so. <laughs> yeah, so, so you, can, you can, if you have enough XML QEMU foo, you can make this, you can make, uh, make it all happen automatically for you. But uh, so there, there's some work there. Um, and, and we, at the same time, we sort of added basic IP link, you know, support. So you can change some very basic attributes. You know, I think the MAC address can be set through this. Um, I don't know what else. The link can be put up and down, I believe. Maybe a few other things. But we, we really I haven't made much progress, I don't think, on that, on that side. So, okay, good. So one of the most fundamental things would be adding multiple MAC addresses. Right, so today we do IP link add VF MAC address. Um, you know, the, there's a, one option would be to uh, just extend that and maybe add more MAC addresses. Say you want to have four or more MAC addresses. Um, I don't know if this is such a good idea, but it's it's one idea I had. Um, it's it's sort of trivial to implement, which is the nice thing. You don't have to go and reinvent anything. It's already there. Um, it's it's like a fairly small patch, and uh, most of the hardware supports it. Do you want the hypervisor to give the Mac, uh, another MAC address to the, v, to the VM? Yeah. Or you want the VM to, because no, a, normal, I a standard I, NIC card have a single MAC that is burned in the factory. That is the MAC that you give him to, for VF? The, for, to this VF. Okay. If, you, if this VF want to have like, like a standard um, Linux machine, if you want to have more, more MAC address, is, your, is the MAC address of the, v, uh, of the VM, 
You don't need to give him through the NIC those uh, MAC address. Um, it's it's more of a receive thing, right? You receive packets with this MAC address. You want to send them to this VF. So the, the API should be, and we're supporting it. That's the the VM that's running on the on the virtual function mm -hmm. can ask for more more MAC addresses. This this is a. An, a model where you trust your VM to tell you what MAC right. addresses it wants. That's that's one model that can be supported. The other model is you you already know what MAC addresses and you allocate a VM a set of MAC addresses. What's that? Libvirt style. This is yeah, like a Libvirt kind of thing where you provision your network and then you tell the VM that it, it's allowed to have to use these MAC addresses. Because usually what OpenStack is do, it will give you a few networks, a few uh, virtual NICs. If you want to have few MAC address or few VLANs, you will get. Yes, but OpenStack already does have the option of supporting additional address pairs per port. So if I want to specify uh, that a given interface can support five different IPs and each of those with a specific MAC address, that's possible now with current OpenStack. Because there's a mechanism, was it, I think it's a IP allowed adders. Yeah. Um, that'll uh, let you populate those. So it would just be a matter of translating the OpenStack command into this for a VF. And, and then it's like that, that's where the libvirt support comes in, right? It's just a back end. Uh, it's, you translate it there and right. throw it down via Netlink. Um, yeah, so if it's a need, so it's not a problem, of course, to implement it. Is there a question over here or comment or something? Yeah, I got I got four mics up here. Somebody could j join me. I don't have to sit by myself. All right. Uh, so one way of interpreting uh, the extra MAC address would be uh, so the way I understood this as that you're uh, letting the PF know to allow an extra MAC address to be used by the VF would be if if you bond two uh, VFs and and the bonding driver yeah. flips over and configures yet another MAC address and then and right. the, the VF goes and asks for permission and this this would be a the hint to the pf to allow that mac address right now there's there's no way you can do that right, right. either either you let it make up arbitrary mac addresses right or right. or you or, could turn on the ip allowed adders and you let the uh bird io port have to go and change its mac address yeah neither of those are really great right so th this would yeah. let you say like give it a whitelist right of all sorts of mac addresses well, yeah, that you, would you could bounce it back and forth to where the vf can do either the bird io mac address or its own yeah. And the other side can't, so then it doesn't matter which port comes up first. Right. So I clearly see the need for one more MAC address uh, for sure. so At least two. I mean, if we're going to allow two, we might as well allow 10 or 20 yeah. or whatever, right? Exactly. Point, it's, right. it's just a for loop right. or whatever. It's a list. Right. And if somebody comes up with some double bonded something or another, then yeah, more the power The only thing you have to still deal, deal with is the situation where you run out of MAC addresses. Right, right. So that's uh, going to be like an enomem type response. Yeah, like I think we just throw the standard error back and let libvirt populate right. that all the way up the stack, and then OpenStack will wrap some Python around it or something. Yes, yeah, so it'll be an <laughs> undecipherable error message. <laughs> At that level, yeah. So for the I-40, at least, it's coming as part of the trusted VF support, adding multiple L2 addresses. Um, well, this wouldn't even necessarily need to be something that would be trusted VF, just because this would be the PF specifying this VF can support MAC address A, MAC address B, MAC address C. So this is the PF explicitly saying these are the MACs that this VF can support. Instead of right now, the current interface is you can only support this one MAC address on the VF, which ends up being really limiting. Y yeah, but think about it like it's a, a normal server. You buy a NIC, you just have one MAC address. No, most NICs don't have just one MAC address well, they can support. You, That's the whole point of MAC VLAN, is you can support no, 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 10 can, MACs. But and, who, who gives you the MAC? The MAC has come from the, from the machine. It's not right. come from the network. Because when you buy a network... Not, not, no, not it, true, it, not in the world. Administrator. Network administrator so the can network, set whatever okay. MAC address they want on the system. But the network administrator needs to speak with the uh, virtual machine. You don't need to speak with the NIC to tell him that. Well, no, see, that's the thing is, how, do you, how does he tell the machine that? You're talking about a side channel you have to create then for us to tell the VF that these are the addresses that you can have. And yeah, but this is administration thing. It's not like you're taking, you have, it's not like how you It's an access control list is what this yeah. is. What we're creating here is an access control list that says this VF can have these MAC addresses. So we can, can do. Can have or, should, or, or need to? Can have. Okay. 
That's basically the idea here. Um, and then, yeah. It's a, so it's a filtering list, right? Right. Okay. So, so it's not a configuration, it's a filtering list. Right. Okay. Yeah, it still defaults and, to the And it's one. usually tied to the XML that you spin up the VM with. So, right. And it's all done at the QEME level. And so when you build the QEME level, you want to spin up the VM and also configure the PF at the same from the same yeah, configuration so channel. So, like right, so, so it's not only MAC address. So why not to say that's okay, I want to allow this server only to speak uh, port 80, only HTTP. So but, it's the same. If it's a... Well, it's the same, kind of, it's the same well, thing. It's why do you limiting to MAC address? Well, in this case, it's just the, that's the standard filtering mechanism for a lot of uh, devices. Because so like yeah, we have it today. Ends up being like the bonding scenario, yeah. where you have two interfaces you bond. Okay, now we want to let the VF talk using the VertIO interface's MAC address, or let the VertIO interface talk using the VF's MAC address. We want to be able to allow either which way to work. It shouldn't matter which port comes. And, and you shouldn't have to go to like full blown building a firewall to get that, right? Like we already have this layer two support. This is like a small tweak at the bottom right. to now support a lot of functionality that we already have in the Libvirt layer today. Right. It's just, it's just missing. Because yeah, standard OpenStack right now when it creates a uh, port, it'll lock it down to an IP and MAC address pair. For VFs, it tries to do the same thing using just this MAC address, which locks us in at one MAC address. And then, okay, if we have to do any other MAC addresses over that port, well, it was a nice thought anyway, but we're locked out due to the hardware right now. And so if we have the ability to let it use any of the MAC addresses that we gave the system, then we can alternately route traffic through the VF that, are, that maybe might belong to that bird IO interface instead. Okay. So, I think another. The, still the, you know, the solution is uh, two ways, right? The PF configures multiple MAC addresses for the VF or the VF says, I want more MAC addresses, right? Right, so if the VF is the one requesting the more MAC addresses, then that would probably be the privileged VF. Correct. Or the yeah, and, and VF we have a bit for that now, right? That, that went in? There's an NDO op. NDO op, yeah. yeah, yeah, I gotta check it yeah, out. Yeah, I, I was just talking about those it's patches not, that the not VF- required, uh, this is, how we call it? There was another NDO command, uh, spoof check? Yeah, because that's yeah. one of those. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, uh, yeah. the security to this specific MAC. Right. So if it's not spoof check, it can be asked for different things. Right. Right. There's a, there's a trusted VF IP link command resident. Yeah, but this there. is new. Before that's. Uh, yeah, the trust, trusted VF is what says whether or not you can request it, but the spoof check is what ends up locking things down if you try to use an address you didn't request. Yeah. So right now, so it's, it's, yeah. no, it's, it's not uh, it's ambiguous. It's not. Uh, yeah. Well defined, I think, because in uh, Mellanox we are allowed to ask for many MAC addresses. Right. So I guess uh, yeah. the spoof check only limits um, your transmit traffic, uh, you know, if it doesn't match your MAC. But if you have a trusted BF, yeah, you're pretty much saying that it can do any functionality of the PF. That's pretty much it. So you're opening up the resources right. on the device for the VF. Right. Yeah, even to support promiscuous. Promiscuous unicast even, not only multicast. Yep. Yeah, because you're basically letting the VF possibly denial of service the system if it really wants to. So. Yeah. No, but you, you, we have customers that have a few VFs, only yeah. two, one or two. Yep. And you want to. Right. We have customers even ask for yep. single via, virtual function. Right. Yep. Like I said, if it, it's the user wants permission to shoot themselves in the foot option. So it's like, yep, go yep. ahead. Go ahead. If you think you can do it without hurting yourself, more power to you. All right, cool. I mean, and the advantage of doing this is it, it's simple, it's already there. Yep. The stack above it already knows how to handle it, and it costs us like right. very few lines of code. So if you talk about villa, uh, MAC address, I think the second one is the VLAN. Right, and that's already part of the FTB. It's already getting patched to the driver. Just yep. no dri driver, yep. at least the Intel drivers abort when they get it, because so, they don't know what to do, right? They don't know how to do the VLAN filtering. They uh, do actually in the they, hardware, they but they... Do we, do we actually con you can configure set, it now? So IP link, yeah, you can set the BF. VLAN. And does the hard does the hardware understand what to do with it? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So we, we do have support for that then on then. Yeah. Cool. That, that, that's was actually in use in my demo. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, perfect. That's, but this is uh, only the default. Demo. Yeah. I, the yeah, the the VLAN, VLAN configuration which exists today with IP link for a VF is yeah. more like a transparent VLAN. Uh, yeah. the, the VF is not supposed to know about it, right. and that's all the untagged packets get it's like a port based VLAN. Yeah. Uh, but I do see a need for. Um, a, a what, what we call a guest VLAN, where uh, these packets are tagged by the VF 
from uh, originated from the guest, right. but they're okay. Uh, you know, you love that. I mean, it's not like a tenant kind of a thing. Yep. Uh, it's like multiple VFs in the same enterprise using different uh, VLAN Yeah, so basically VLAN what tags. you're looking is at is what, Q and Q then for that kind of setup? Or? Uh, you couldn't. Or you're talking you about may, that on a flat. Right. You may not use a transparent VLAN yeah. at that case and just use a flat right. single tag VLAN, right? So today we don't have a mechanism to program those kind well, of... If you don't set the VLAN I'll, I'll IXGBE card can, to let you do can that. Can I make a higher level? Okay. Um, g guys, so, so what, what we have to do, I think, is we, uh, I, I'm calling this legacy SRV, and now the OVS or the flow-based or the SDN one comes. We have to decide if we want to productize these two models. So we have to learn from the switch guys that we had. <laughs> like we have to, to either support the dot one d bridge or dot one q bridge. You know, Ethernet, they do it many years. Let's do that, right? You're, you're reinventing it now. If you want this to function as a layer to switch, so this is something well defined. Let's do that. If you want to go do the SIOV, uh, the um, SDN one, I believe we have to do both. Like, excuse me, but you wasted 20 minutes now, right? Dot one Q bridge and dot one D bridge is something well defined. Let's just go learn it because we, we don't know it. We are new guys. We're not familiar with well, that. No, we are, we're actually very familiar with the I didn't mean John Fastenberg. I mean everyone but, else. Um, for you. Let's, the, the point of this is that the entire stack knows what this is. The semantics are well understood. Adding another line of, this is very few lines of code, and it adds a lot of value to Libvirt. That, that's all I'm saying. Yes, but you see, people start to talk to you about the loud VLANs, default VLANs, trunking. This is all well-defined, right? This is all well-defined. It's a solved problem. Well, well, it's a solved problem, except for nobody implemented it the solved way in a lot of cases. No, but let's, 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 do, let's, let's, let's do the, the one of our cools and, and do that, right? Why do we have to reinvent something which is already solved? OK, um, <laughs> let me scope this again down. Oh. This, is, this is really just to add the functionality that would be very useful to Libvirt and OpenStack today. On, it, on all the next Right. Have. So what I'd yeah, say someone is... Someone asking this and someone asks that, and it's all yeah. solved problems. What, what if you don't use OVS and you don't use the open flow and the whole So that's what I said. I'm, I'm referring this as, the, as this stuff. So you want, I think you want the dot one D bridge, if I heard you correct. So we will do that. But we'll not reinvent what is dot one D bridge is. Okay. Right? <laughs> Personally, I'm not a big believer in the dot one D and dot one Q. I think we have to go to the... <laughs> What we, we have limited resources, right? So I think in, in this space, people want to see more the, the representation stuff. Sorry, and I, 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 stuff. I, no. Okay, let's, let's move on. I, I think, I, I think. We see more business now in the other approach. Yeah, okay, but I, I think it's fair to say that people are doing 802.1Q bridging today and people are doing um, flow-based bridging. And I, I, I don't want to, in that bit debate here. Um, I think I'll move on, but you know, the point here is that we have a, a fairly simple thing we can do that we can get a lot of value for, from, and I, I think we'll, I'll probably work on this at some point. So, all right. So, so this, this is maybe a, a bit more controversial, and uh, you know, it's like if you want to start doing things like IP addresses, do you want to drive that through IP link um, in, in a similar fashion? Um, what, what this would mean is that you could you know, also specify the IP address over the same interface that you specify the MAC, so you could do a MAC IP pair. Um, again, this is very libvert-ish. This would be something libvert would love to, probably be very easy to consume from a libvert standpoint and an OpenStack standpoint. Um, and again, it doesn't look like a huge, um, a huge addition. We already have the VF notation. We already have all the options. Um, and uh, you can go from there. Um, yeah, I know, IPv4, IPv6, and then you want to start doing but routing. On, on what and then VLAN you are you going to put those uh, IP yeah. addresses? You need to specify what on what VLAN. Yeah, this is opening, kind of opening up a right. yeah. box here. So, it's like because currently it's working well with uh, the HCP. Yeah, yeah I, I know. So, I mean, I, that's why I have question marks there. I just thought I'd bring it yeah. up. I, I put it here because it's kind of the natural thing if you try to continue this IP thing too far. Right. This is sort of what happens. And you know, I agree it's a bit questionable. But at this if, point. if it's not a virtual function, if it's like it's a VM with a virtio, mm -hmm. do you give this all parameters? Yeah. How? 
Well, not do, not do, do, it, it, through well, the right? Well, we don't actually, well, we end up feeding it through DHCP is what we do. And then on the other side, we've got an ACL that says, okay, if anything other than this IP address comes through, we block it. So maybe we need to take the, we don't need to take the configuration, we need to take the ACL, right. the ACL through TC yep. to use it into yep. the hardware. Mm, yeah. I don't want, you, you're uh, inventing I, I things that's... That is actually a well, better way to do it. The only thing but, is, yeah, you didn't have to have some means of hardware offloading via the TC, so that's the only thing. Yeah. You need it to might actually IPK, be you easier, don't though, than, than doing this sort of explosion of IPv4, IPv6, yeah. MDB. Like, it, 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 the problem is it's sort of a losing... It's hard to f do that yeah. because it just keeps getting worse and worse. Right. As people yep. get more and more corner cases. Yeah, because this is right? something where you, it's basically an ACL that needs to be... Uh, hand it off to the hardware is what it is. Right, so. and, and then if you're trying to be truly trying to translate, you know, what OpenStack or whatever orchestration so, so you want maybe to what do. we should look at instead of trying to add support for more Macs and IPs is maybe do IP link ACL add or something like that. Yes. Or IP ACL add BF uh, or something along the, or IP link ACL to where then you could go in and define a Mac, a VLAN, an IP address for what's allowed and what isn't. Yeah, the, the, the trouble is like that got shot down. I think, like people didn't like that. <laughs> well, because essentially that's what we're proposing. What yep. the Mac one and this one is right, it's essentially right. just ACLs because we don't actually have a mechanism for feeding this back to the VF. So it is kind of would would be cleaner to treat them as access control list rather than trying to say these are part of the configuration for the device. Or, or do them through TC. Yeah, or do yeah, them yeah. through TC. You could do it with a translation layer in software too. You would know yep. you could make make it libvirt friendly, so that right. libvirt didn't even know it was using TC. Yep. And I, I think actually, so the, the point of these two build up slides was that that's that's really where I think I'm going. Yeah, it is you know I might add the L2 support because I get a big win from that right away, right. and immediately on all my legacy stuff without doing much work, yep. um, or even changing the stack all that much because the stack right. already understands it. But then if you try to start extending and extending and extending, it, it almost makes sense just just to put a, um, a TC layer in there and just start <laughs> using it like that. Um, and it, it sort of naturally matches to where yeah. those orchestration layers well, are going anyway. I think right now most of this stuff, at least on the OVS side, is controlled via contract, if I remember right, something along those yeah, lines. Yeah, yeah. Contract and net filter rules. Right, and, and this is a bit tricky to do in hardware, right? Connection tracking and all this fun stuff. Right, so. but if there's some way to come up with a simplified way of defining right. it, then, yeah, no, then I'll yeah, I see all, yeah. I see yeah. all base, yeah. yeah. And I think also the, if we're talking about switch, dev, I think also the switch guys, the, the real switch. Yep. Also, would like to have an an ACL API, so right. it's the same because this is a switch. We need to yep. look at it as way, a switch. The better yeah. way to look at it is just yeah, it's essentially ACLs that we're wanting to program. So we might want to come up with an ACL API that yeah. uses TC or whatever. IP whatever, yeah, but yeah. whatever. whatever yeah. But the concept is like an ACL. It's yeah. not like a configuration to right. the to the virtual yeah. function. Yeah, because that, that is essentially what we're looking at with this. So that would make a lot more sense. Okay, cool. I'll I'll try to go that route and see what I come up with. Yeah. I think we're I think we're actually pretty close to that actually. Yeah. So, cool. So then everyone's favorite topic um, that we can talk about is that uh, I, I have a, a need to send packets from the PF to the BF directly. Um, specifically, I have some control packets. I have a lot of exception traffic on the um, that for some reason my my NIC didn't know how to match like a uh, um, like a whatever, some control packet from the network, right? Maybe it's so, a controller. So that's packet. exactly what we what we present. So so okay, let's back up. Okay. I know it is exactly what you presented. I'm trying to break it down into small little pieces okay. and not throw the entire OVS stack on top of it right now because I, I want this outside of OVS. Um, no no no, the representer. It's I know I, I know it's exactly what, this, the reason is 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 exactly what you you presented is because we've been talking for this about this yeah. for like a year. Um, so the. The point is that we we need something, and uh, there's I th there's two op options that I came up with. One is you have a net dev that represents a VF, and I think you need to clearly identify to the stack that it's a VF net dev because you don't want the stack to try to use it like it's a real net dev, right? Because 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 you might <coughs> blindly start using it, and it has some interesting characteristics in that it's not really a function. So I think it's right? need to be a. Switch dev is a very good way to aggregate all the all the ports of so the do, switch. So do you know yeah, do you know a port is a switch dev somehow? I'm looking at your email. Is uh, there a question? The, or, well, I think isn't the oh, what is it? 
There's a, a, an attribute that gets set on it. You set the ID, the index. John, so why do you treat it different than the tap device? The tap device also is not a normal network device. Yeah, but you know it's a tap device usually, right? Yeah. So the buffer presenter is just the same. Yeah, so I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying there should be some identifier. Yes, yeah, yeah, so we, 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 the, the virtual function representer in our implementation is also a switch dev instance, so it has their attribute ID. So if you would, if you would run an IP link and look on the, uh, it already prints you the, the switch dev ID, so all the representers have the same ID. What, what else do you want? Do you want some feature? No, 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 that might be good enough. Well, I, I might actually go so far as put a, like a feature flag in there or something, but. Okay, yeah, we can do a feature flag. No, because if you have two NICs, two cards, Two SRIV cards, you want to distinguish between the ones that yes. belong so it's to the a, first one and the second card. So it's a private flag, right, John? Like the, a tap has a, you want, like, if it's a, to be identified as a representative, like a tap or, okay, we'll, we'll do that. Yeah, the, the, the only other, the, I'll just get to this really quick is the, the other option that, I, that we have is that you could use a socket um, uh, auxiliary data to indicate where you want to send a packet and then you don't have to create a net dev at all. It's, it works. I think the idea that if you use a, a net device, you can connect them to a Linux bridge in order to forward the traffic. You sure. said you have a, a missed traffic or there's, something there's, like that. Are we going to forward it in the... So I think there's like four comments out there and we've been talking okay. to ourselves. Sorry. Good. Uh, so is the idea for this uh, representative net dev to be like a control net dev so that it doesn't get any data plane traffic? So, I mean, is there a need to create two flavors of net dev is what we're saying? I think there's a there's a use case where this is not just a control net dev, and you, you may have exception track it that, that needs to be at a reasonable performance level. It's like you can't work on the assumption that you'll never have an exception that this is always exception traffic and it can be low performant. And I, I also don't see any reason to limit it to that. Really, it's running over. If you're going to run it over the PF, it's going to have access to some set of queues. Um, you, you probably have enough queues to. You know, you might want to prioritize it lower than your PF traffic for some reason, but that's a priority, I think, Cole. But I, I don't see any reason to limit it no. in some sense. Sure. But I, I thought, you know, somewhere you mentioned that some way we'll have to say that normal traffic doesn't go on that net dev. I think you want to indicate somehow to the stack that it is, a, it is somehow special and that it's not a, a normal hardware net dev in the sense that it has its own PCIe function. Meaning if I fire up two iperf sessions on it, I'm not going to get, this, I mean, I'm not gonna get the same amount of performance as I would if I had two physical functions. Right. And I think this is valuable just not because I can articulate exactly why, but it seems going to be useful for debugging at least. And it, it seems easy to do, <laughs> like just set a flag somewhere or a bit or a net dev type. It's, it seems trivial. So I think what would be even more interesting is if you move that new crafted net device inside the VM. So think of a container running inside a VM. And uh, from, from the networking forwarding needs inside the VM, you want to control the hardware offload of your bare metal machine. Right? <laughs> That's where it gets really interesting. That's where you would have huge benefits, because all of, a, all of a sudden, you're programming the entire path through two operating systems. right? And you gain um, fairness in terms of you could allocate or assign a queue per container that is running inside the VM. I think what you're saying is, uh, maybe I'm just going to rephrase this, see if I get it right, that, that you're giving the, the VF some access to switch resources or hardware resources? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's really interesting. It's just we haven't, like that API doesn't exist at all and we have, um, yeah, I think it, it would be worthwhile though. So I, I just want to take a step back to the merits of having net dev from my point of view is that I, I can see basically three set, separate sets of functionality you might want. Um, and in the context of OBS, you probably want them all simultaneously. <laughs> um, what, one is passing packets back and forth. We already talked about that. The other one is uh, provisioning. So you want to be able to configure the device somehow. So you might want to attach it to OBS or the bridge or do anything else. And the other is you might want to get some information about the device, statistics, and so on and so forth. And from my point of view, the advantage of using a net dev, although it may be special somehow with a flag or whatever, is we already have all the tooling to do all of those things and more, and we know how to deal with them. And it seems like a pretty good way to model it from my point of view. Cool. I like it.
Anything else going on out there? <laughs> um, so I, I think, uh, how far is your code along? Can you submit the, the, the net dev stuff that you have? And can you submit it independent of all the other stuff so that we can look at it um, by itself? Yes. We, will do, uh, we try to do it this week, but. <laughs> no, so, so you're asking how, how much the, the, the sole representative stuff can be separate from. Yes, we, we, we can, we'll do uh, initial submission, which doesn't offload anything, right? Only slow pass. Yeah, if you do me a favor and just submit that piece, and let's get that piece in, and then let's worry about arguing about yeah. how OBS works. Cool. Um, sounds like we'll move forward on this. I was going to explain how I thought this might work, but it, I think we pretty much understand that you know it's a, it's attached to the PF. We send traffic to it; it gets sent to the VF. Um, Kind of almost looks like a DSA type representation. It, it looks very similar to DSA. Wait, actually, maybe we can talk about that. We've thought about using DSA directly, but it wasn't quite a good fit, I don't think. Yeah, because I don't um, think you have means of tagging the packets to identify them other than the source MAC address, which may or may not be set by the VF. Right. Oh. Sorry. Um, I was just thinking, uh, like in the case of DSA, usually they have some sort of tagging mechanism to identify the source of the packets. You don't really have that in SRV unless you want to trust the uh, MAC address, the source MAC address, from the packets themselves, which may be expensive having to do a lookup against the source MAC address to determine the destination or the device it originated from. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, my assumption is that that's all to do with uh, how the data, like how the packets are communicated across the PCI bus, if it's a PCI device. And that might be um, device dependent. Yeah, I think some devices have a tag. Some devices have a bit in the descriptor you can set, right? Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I know this. Um, sure. So it, it's, the tag stuff might align closer to DSA. Yeah. Putting something okay. in the descriptor is not DCA to me. So if, um, all, if all the vendors can sit down and agree on a, a consistent tagging. Common descriptors. Yeah, so it's never gonna <laughs> happen, right? So we no, just have never to gonna happen. To the I, I, I think the net device should actually. be the proprietary of each uh, vendor. So it's yeah, yeah. up to the vendor how it uh, classify those packets. Sure. Could right. be a metadata. Could be. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, agreed. Cool. And because do, do, could be that we want this to have a RSS to this uh, net device to support RSS if you want to have a lot of traffic. Yep. Or, you know. Yeah. Right now we are limiting ourselves because we said it's. You may want to send a few packets, but in the future you can yep. ask for more. And, and I'll just get rid of this auxiliary data idea, just because it, it seems like maybe doing a net dev is easier. Yeah, most likely. It's also not as strange from a from a operating system kind of point of view. Uh, cool. Excuse me. Yes. But, uh, if you want to move uh, data in the same machine, so it's faster to do it in a, on a Paraview channel. So. You might do, want uh, to have a generic representer that has a power virtual channel to the guest, to support it, and move traffic to it, because it would be much, much faster. Are you, are you talking about east-west traffic here? Or what, what, yes, yeah. for example, so you, all, all traffic that you want to in inject. Like so, you, in so you have some channel between guests? No, between guests it's not secured, but between yeah. the guest. Uh, between the uh, PF and the guest. PF and the VF, yeah. In the software? Yeah, yeah. real yeah. Yeah. For, yeah. Does, the, does the guest have another device? Right, that, that, right. that's what's implied by that scenario, yeah. is that you have a vert IO and a VF. Okay. Yeah, think yeah. about sure. a bond in the no, VF. No, 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 I, I get what you're saying. I, I was trying to see if you had some. You can think about it as a, you have a, a device in the guest that has the vert IO channel and a VAF as an accelerator. Of the but it does imply that your VM knows something about how to do that, right? Well, it implies that the VF probably has an idea of the topology. Yeah. So that the VF knows to go across the vert IO to the PF, whereas if it's going anywhere else, it has to go. So it ends up, probably have to program some extra routing tables to resolve something like that. Yeah, how does, how does that work? Do you, are you, do you know? Or do you have an idea? No, we are thinking about it right <laughs> okay. now, and we're not sure how <laughs> to do it, it, but yeah. You, you yeah. can bond them together. You can it's work. It's a research yeah. problem. It's yeah. a year of bonding, yeah. Yeah, but then you have to have a really smart bond that knows, okay, 
Yeah. If it's PF, it goes down the vert.io. If it's <laughs> anything else, it goes. Yeah, but yeah. that's we will yeah. send some command. Okay, those kind of traffic, like say multicast, yeah. we don't want to replicate. Right. But I think so we can send. I think it we're getting into a solution space for something that may not. Yeah. Be something we want to chase out, <laughs> chase down right now. So. Is the performance that much different if it was going on the uh, bus? It, it it really it yeah. really depends. It, it well, <laughs> I, I've done this metric like twenty different ways, and it, it really depends on what you want to optimize for, right? And, and the the traffic workload, and the well, PIE bus. Speed yeah. If go. nothing else, Very, the thing you have to keep in mind is if going cross vert IO, you don't actually cross any like PCIe bus. Right. Okay. So if if you're looking at you know a slow NIC that's on a by four Gen two. Yeah, you're not going to go any faster than seven, whereas you can do 36 gigs if you're going straight across for I.O. So it just depends on what and your scenario is. there's some weird um, latency versus bandwidth trade-offs versus CPU usage trade-offs. Right. It depends on what you are trying to optimize for. Yep. So then, again, the problem becomes that the L2 driver would be doing learning to figure out which traffic is east-west versus... Right. The, the, something would have to figure out how to route the traffic. So. I think we already have the facility, it's called team device with, with modules, modes, right? That's a yeah. special local balancing mode of a team device. Yeah. If you can push the complexity into the VM, sure you can use the team device, assuming it's supported there, but you, you might want to hide the complexity from the VM. <laughs> right. That, that's the thing. Is like, like I said, yeah, it becomes the VM needs to know way too much about the topology of everything. Or, or, you, or you put the team device right under the VM, right? And then you run it through PCIe, which bypasses most of the stack except for uh, a small layer in QEMU that has that team logic. Sure, yeah. if we can work out how to do that. <laughs> then the, it's, the guest just has to come up with a new device to represent the team driver at the team thing, because it's not really a driver anymore, because it'd probably have to be represented somehow in user space. Yeah. It's, could imagine being somewhat of a win. It's not really direct assignment anymore, but it's, it's, it's like, can be good. Yeah. It, it helps with the migration issue. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. anyway. So. All right, I'll move on to my next appeal. I like Libvert. Be nice if we get some feed functionality in Levert, just because it makes life easier for me to test a lot of the stuff. But um, I'll have to see. This might be maybe a translation layer. Maybe I can just write a little XML to at the bottom and, and translate, you know, all that stuff that's yeah, in Levert well, today into uh, into what we're building inside the bottom. Yeah, of it's the just stack. a matter of making sure it knows what APIs it needs to speak to where. Yeah. So yeah, we already are going through what the IP uh, route interface. Yeah. Yep. Rather than IP and that link, so. Cool. Yeah. No objections to extra support if I, if I do it. <laughs> uh, live migration. I, I don't have any comments on this. I thought maybe Alex would want to talk about live migration, because well, you did a little bit this morning. Yeah, I did a little bit. And, and I don't know if anybody here jumped up and down. And, no, and I, I don't think we have anybody maybe. from like any kind of the, any of the PCI people here, and that's the thing, is it's yeah. mostly the PCI, PCI and QEMU mailing lists where I've seen a lot of the action for that. Yeah, so I guess the uh, infomercial, there's some people working on live migration, and they, they probably would like input if, if people have devices they can work on it with or mm -hmm. are, are also interested in this problem. It would be nice to help them out. All right, let's see what else we got. Any other things that we want to talk about or opens? It seems like... Um, we're going to make some progress on the on the via, or on the net dev stuff, and and we'll go yeah. from there. And uh, yeah, because was it? I think we agreed ACLs are for that. For the and then I think we'll build like a libvert to ACL translator yeah. so that we can load that into the into the hardware and we'll plug that into libvert, and we'll um, that'll give us kind of the native libvert support that we right. that we want, without having to just kind of extend the stuff that we have into kind of strange. Right. IP VF commands. Yep. Cool. And I, that's all I had. Is there anything anybody else out there want to talk about? A question. You, I'm trying to, to open it. At, we spoke about TC and we spoke about how to represent those FAF. So the ACL should be on the representer of this FAF or on the path? I would put them, so it depends on, on where they are, but I imagine, so like if you're XML, if, you, if you're building up a VM, then you'd want to put them on the VF, because the VF is going to be the, right. the 
kind of the quantifier for that. So that becomes the thing is, yeah, essentially what we need to do is actually, I think, get switch dev going for SRIOV in general. And um, once you'd have those yeah. representers you could throw out there, then it's just a matter of, okay, put this a ACL on that VF and just yeah. go. Like today you do it in the IP table. Right. This. Yeah, you could do that. Yep. John, so yeah. if we have the representative uh, net dev, the problem of having the VFID for IP commands, that should go away, right? You can uh, directly use the representative net dev for the VF. And you would do the same for the TC tool, right? You would use the representative net dev instead of using um, some kind of VFID to make a rule for the VF. Yeah, I think so. That would be one way to do it. I mean, we'll have this case where you can use both either for, you know, for a lot of the. Yeah, the because things. VFID, I guess, is the the only place it is evident as in the IP tool. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense. Yeah, I think that should be fine. So the, the, the only issue I have with um, native representation for VFs is you can do a lot, a whole lot of things with a net device that you can not necessarily map to hardware. And since, do we just want to allow the user to shoot themselves and shoot themselves in, um, in their own foot, or like, do we want to draw a line somewhere and only allow a it's, partial it's subset like, like of functionality? Changing the MTU, right? This is like the simplest case. Yeah, That's exactly. Very strange, right? Yes. Like, you go in and you change the MTU of the VF. Did you just change the MTU on the VM? Because that's not a, even a no, that, that doesn't make any sense to most VMs, right? If you, and, and do you signal to the VM that you did this? Because what would you, what, would, what sort of event would you give in the VM? Well, the question ends up becoming, yeah, how do you want to interpret it? What, what happens on a switch when you change the MTU? Does it Draw just, buckets. Yeah. What happens yeah. when you change it, it the MTU the, off the top? I really want to make the... Yeah, but does your NIC, I mean, the problem is we're going to have hardware variability here. How much hardware will support setting the MTU on a... Although, arguably, airport. one thing I would like to see is for, like, the SROV case, MTU is the maximum transmission unit. <laughs> it is not the maximum received packet size. Um, it's kind of become a bit of a headache because, you know, if you end up with a VF that's got, or a, a setup that has a mixed environment, Already, there's a lot of NICs that'll just, okay, we receive whatever the largest one is, and anyone can transmit it, whatever. And so that's the thing is we need to be, we can probably be a little bit more liberal on that in terms of how we want to interpret MTU. If anything, it'd probably just be another ACL that says, okay, if, if you can support it, this is the maximum this guy can send. But otherwise, it would probably just be a... Whoever sets the highest gets to set what the hardware well, can receive. It, and it also is how much do you believe that it's a switch dev object? Because if you were really setting the MTU on a switch dev object, you're talking about transmitting to the VM. Right. Which is would actually be receiving to the VM, right? You see right. what I'm saying? Not the other way around. Yeah. You see? So, um, yeah. I don't, I don't know what the Nick guys would... So it's kind make, of make it a global setting then in that case. So it, sure. for one, that's valid. It. I think that's valid. That's actually would be a more valid. But, but the, the bigger problem is you have a net dev that doesn't look like doesn't work like a net dev, right? Well, how does switch dev handle it right now? I don't know. Where's our switch dev guy? <laughs> I was kind of thinking initially we'd probably have the net dev do almost nothing, right? It wouldn't support the open method. Right. It wouldn't support the closed method. It just return eno dev or. But I don't think we have a like right. we don't have a way in the stack when when. Um, I guess we don't need this anymore. We don't, we don't have a way in the stack, right? Like if you set the MTU and you don't have the NDO op implemented, it just falls back into the software. Yep, it just uh, that caps it there, at There's no air path back up for a lot of the stuff because we, right. we just emulate it in software if the hardware doesn't support it. Yep. So you can do all sorts of things and think that they're working and then it won't work. <laughs> so you just code up a dummy net dev for each of your VFs and call it <laughs> just about. Right? Uh, you can implement the NDO op and return an error code if someone tries to change the MTU, right? I mean, you the, can, but the, the, my the initial point was you kind of limit the exposure initially on the implementation for these the switch dev devices, right? That we would maybe um, instantiate for the VFs, right? Maybe they don't do anything. So if DHCP tries to open the interface and start broadcasting, you know, away, you're just gonna be like, no, <laughs> right? I'm not gonna allow you to do that. I mean, I'm, I'm not in particular worried about NDO ops because those can be made specific and implemented right. or not implemented. Um, but the net device is so generic, and if index is so generic, you can you can do a whole bunch of configuration um, scenarios which just just make no sense whatsoever. 
I mean, it's, Switch Dev has the same problem today, I right? Know. Like you can yeah, build entire things and it doesn't make, it just breaks. It's like, I, I don't know if that's good though, especially on something that we have that works already today. Like we, we, we I don't know. I, I, think, I, th I think it will become confusing. The more things we map to net devices, it, the, more the more confusing it will be because it's not even visible what, what's properly mapped to hardware and whatnot. It's very difficult right now. We need to find a high level solution to that. I think so too. And I think it's different than Switch Dev because Switch Dev, is a switch. It's this big object, physical thing, right? And when you configure it, you think you, you should probably know that it's a switch. Yeah. Like this is this is a host. Yes. And and we we I don't think we want to get to the have expose this to the host, right? Well, I don't know. See, that's the thing, though. For the most it, part, it's a switch. It's not. SROV is just a brain dead switch. It just doesn't know how to learn in a lot of cases. But the configuration channels are different. The configuration path is different. I think what John is saying is that if you're using switch dev models and you're using the Linux APIs to configure a switch, you are very much aware that you're dealing with a switch. If you're on a host, you're do doing configuration, you might not even be aware that you have an SRIV capable NIC. Right? It's existing scripts that run and do stuff with net devices. Yeah. I know it's, it's a small difference, and I agree with you that yeah. it. But well, well, I think if nothing else, we'll, we'll probably just need to go through it. So, so the other problem is, how would you know that his NIC supports it, that his NIC doesn't, and you have right. three different vendors' NICs in a system, you set MTU up on all of them, and one of them does it, the second one sets it globally, and the third one well, does nothing. Well, unfortunately, I think what we're going to end up with is a bunch of slave net devs where the slave... We're going to end up with the DSA-type scenario is what we're going to end up with, where we're having to define... Okay, this is a slave driver for, you know, Intel. This is a slave driver for Mellanox. This is a slave driver for Chelsea. What we end up with is essentially, you'll end up with a set of NDO ops that have to tie into certain functions that can then tell you yes or no, can this support it, and if so, what's the scenario? So every net dev will have to have a corresponding capability query. Well, every NDO a, a function that it can call into, because that's how DSA does it right now. Essentially, there's a set of functions that the slave net devs all call into, and that's how it figures out its capabilities. So there's how one does slave the operator driver. Learn? How does the operator learn above it? Yeah, basically, they'll end up having to uh, advertise the capabilities to some, via some mechanism. Yeah, but this is the same issues that right. Switch have. But, right. but it's, it's different than a Switch. This is a host. Like, you know, it, you know you're working on a Switch. You have an expectation of a Switch. This is... This is a host. Yeah, but it's, uh, that, that's the reason I said you need to bond all of them, to, uh, not to bond, sorry, to use a Linux bridge to tie them together. So, so what if so, the Linux... So no, so no one will come and say, okay, I want to put an IP address on this uh, net device, because yeah. that's not uh, make, not make any sense. So I, I put two NICs in the device, I turn on SRLV, I put them all on a bridge, uh, and they have wildly different capabilities. What, how do I, as a user... So you have two bridges, not, you have two cards? But you have no way to stop that from happening today. You, you're just you saying have, you that people happen to know. That's, that's the reason you got that's the, the thing, switch. Uh, switch what ends up happening that's is you're limited to the the overlapping set of capabilities. You're, the, the whatever the least the uh, the com the lowest common denominator ends up becoming what you end up having to support in that kind of scenario. Gets ugly quickly. Yeah, but see, that's the thing is we're not necessarily talking about that kind of thing. It ends up being essentially in the case of SROB, you have a PF and you have VFs. Most likely, your capability set is going to be fairly consistent among those. Yeah. So, in that type of scenario, if you can't change MTU or if it has to be global for everything, that's a fairly easy thing to represent. Yes, there ends up being some side effects. As sort of a capabilities query. What are you going to say? Yeah. yeah uh, I just wanted to know that uh, you are saying that this is something different than uh, than um, uh, standards, which it is not actually. You. Only what you want to do is to uh, set up the, the, the data path. That's basically it, right? So that's exactly what we do in I, I, switches. I, I, so at that level, it's the same. I'm just saying the operator is aware that he's programming a switch. And, you, and that's but you know it for SRI, we as well, the switch ID, you know the type of the device, you know that it is a switch. I'm not sure it's the operator wants to know at that switch, level, though. embedded switch. That's the only difference. Right, because the IP uh, will show that, you know, it's got a parent switch that's linked into and everything, so all the ports will show up as being... I know, but what we're going to have to do is you're going to have to have everything that you can do will have to have an equivalent capabilities bit to say that I can, yes, I can do this, no, I can't. And you'll have to do, a, you'll have to do like a, a you know, 
are, are all these bits set on all net devs or not do it? Right. I mean, that's, that's, if you want it to work, that's what you'll have to end up doing. Well, like, what kind of capabilities is it you have in mind? I set MTU, set port VLAN, set, um, set uh, promiscuous mode so I can actually run the bridge, set... Uh, um, okay, now, what? that's the thing, though. I think you just got into something weird here. So why are you saying promiscuous mode on a switch yeah. port? Okay, so... Um, okay, but the MTU, so you got an NDO that set the right. MTU. What's that? You, you got a proprietary, an NDO function that's, it's a... It's a a, pr a proprietary driver. Of what, what does that mean? I don't know what proprietary driver means. Uh, sorry, it's a, a vendor. A it's vendor a, driver. A vendor driver. Okay. So the vendor need to coordinate all the net, all the net device of this. Uh, so he'll, he'll have to have the capability to query the system and learn for every feature whether or not it exists. See, actually, the more I think about this, this does sound like DSA. DSA, in a lot of cases, you don't have, you know, you've got the ports on one end, and then you've got a device that's sitting there in between that's the actual Ethernet Mac. Because usually it's a five-based uh, switch, and so PF represents that MAC that you're actually seeing traffic on, and the VFs are your virtualized ports on the other side. Yeah. And so that's how you're controlling a lot of this. So it ends up being you send the control command through the PF. So yeah, a lot of this is just sounding like DSA in terms of setup. Or switch dev. Yeah. Well, switch dev runs on top of DSA now. Yeah. So yeah. So I think we might be overcomplicating this. We might want to look at just trying to start on the simple cases and then get into the more complicated stuff later. I think that's probably okay. I just think we're going to have this scenario going forward where we're going to end up in a situation where you have two NICs, two different vendors, two different versions of drivers or something, and you'll have to um, look at this Boolean string and figure out what you can support, and you'll be, have to go down to the lowest common denominator. Or otherwise, strange things will happen. Well, that's the way it is even with Nix right now, so. Mm. Like, honestly, right now, it's, okay, I take a Mellanox and an Intel IXGBE. Yeah. If I take the 4.4 kernel, I put them both in promiscuous mode. Okay, I'm getting VLANs and broadcast on this one. IXGBE, well, it, it's quiet. It doesn't say anything. Huh, what's going on there? You're going to always have some sort of, you know, lowest common denominator between the two. So if I have to run a flat network in order to make it work, that's, you know, what I have to do. I think that this is one of those things where let the users shoot themselves in the foot if they want to, but we shouldn't be just standing in the way because they might shoot themselves in the foot. Okay. Because I think to some extent, you know, the administrator is going to know their topology. We already say, you know, that these ports belong to this switch. So if they're trying to do something bizarre, you know. If not, we will find ourselves every time need to, 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 to add new things because and if it's a switch, it's all well defined. Because it would basically make my life a lot easier if we start going through the switch dev process. Because then it becomes a okay. Yeah. This is a switch. This is supposed to be a switch. This is how it should act. Mm -hmm. So essentially, we end up with the legacy SROV stuff, where it's you know a non-learning switch, doesn't support open flow or any of that. But hopefully, we'll be able to put ACLs on it and say these Macs are what it can send and receive on. Uh, or VLANs or whatever, and then, then we can start, you know, looking at forking it out a little bit. So we've got basically brain dead bridge equivalent of SRIOV or OVS with OpenFlow version of SRIOV, and start looking at forking things out that way. So if I understand this uh, right, there are some uh, capabilities in the device which are more global, like RSS, um, you know, uh, algo uh, the algorithm or whatever you use, triplets versus simple or uh, symmetric, whatever. And th these are like global settings. So do I see this as a switch dev control? And I wouldn't necessarily do a net oh, dev one. I wouldn't one. want to go that far in terms of, you know, can you control RSS via the switch dev? I think no, that should be left. That's, a, that's a port attribute. It has everything yeah. to do with the net dev and nothing to do with In, in some cases, it is probably not a port attribute. It's actually a device attribute. And that's why I'm wondering. Yep. There, there are like some uh, attributes that are global to the device. And uh, we at present have a problem where if I have to control it through a single you know, port or a, you know, um, in an MFP device through a PF, uh, it ends up changing it for everybody underneath. Right. right. That, 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 so, that's kind of getting into an area of, you know, that's not really related to the switching at all, and that goes beyond what we should bothering, be bothering with, with local config. Um, mostly what we're concerned with is the ability, how the traffic flows. We're concerned with the data path, not the where it ends up in the very final, like that last little bit of which queue is it going to end up on. 
It's just what does that guest have access to? That's the, essentially the demarcation point. Once that guest has access to it, it can do what it wants with the data. So we don't need to be controlling things like, you know, the RSS tables, the number of queues, well, not the, not the table, but I, I'm just trying to see if there is a possibility that we could expose some of those, uh, you know, global settings some way, and if it makes sense to do it through switch dev. No, most likely not. That's not a switch functionality that I've ever heard of, so. So I think the, the, the main concern around the net VFS net device would be if you configure it with something that expects a packet to actually flow through the net device. So a new flag and a couple of checks inside the kernel that will, 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 will just bark if you use such a rep representation only net device in, for example, net filter. That might be a good balance and might be enough to avoid confusion on the host side. Well, if you wanted to, you probably could route the traffic through. That's the thing is essentially that's where we get back to DSA because technically as long as you put the VF's MAC address as the destination MAC for any outgoing traffic, it's going to get to that VF one way or the other. The trick is if you want to actually use it to send, right, you send over right. the PF, right? Yep. So you steal a couple of cues from the PF and put it. You don't even have to steal them. You just, just act change like the, the MAC VLAN. Put it on the, yeah. You just set the MAC address and set it out. So that's all it would be. It's essentially just a MAC VLAN at that point, only it's doing the destination MAC instead of the source MAC. Okay. I think we should put something though in, in uh, the, the weird case is like, so you configure something like NFT on top of all this to you, do, did the user actually want it on the local VF that's representative or did he actually want you to load it into the hardware, right? Like, and that's where we right, have and that's like, where it gets kind of little, that's why we have these flags and things, so. Right, and, that, and that's think, kind of the representation, um, I think, where it would be useful to have something like a bridge for legacy, you know, just put a bridge interface on top of it, and then hopefully, eventually, someday, maybe we could offload stuff that goes between the bridge and that port off yeah. to the hardware so we could actually take care of it for us. Sure. But, yeah. That's, yeah, that's what we're trying to do with the open switch. Right. Yeah, but see, you're getting ahead, see. Most of the hardware out there doesn't support the flows, so that's where I'm thinking. What? Like I think also the... But we'll do that. Support flow based. Uh, Alex, with the representers, what we'll do, we submit, we'll do patches that only does do slow pass, and then the step forward would be to support a switch of FDB, right? We don't have to run to flows. Right. So, so also the legacy mode could be embedded in this yep. framework, right? Because that it, it just make things easier in terms of representation, then. Because then, you know, I'm just thinking off the top of my head. Because then, like, yeah, if you support open flows, you go you know, represent it with an OVS switch on top of the ports. Otherwise, it's just like so bridge. Linux, Linux bridge, yeah. Yeah. Some sort of consensus, yeah? Yep. <laughs> Good enough for Friday? <laughs> Anything else that Let's you want to talk about? Let's start coding it, yeah. No? I don't, oh, there we go, got one more, no? All right, well, I think that's it. All right, thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>